Welcome back to another episode of Continua Meditations Discusses. In this episode, we will be reviewing the season finale, the second season finale episode of The Exorcist, entitled Unworthy. So, as always, I'd like to warn all of you that if you haven't seen the season finale of The Exorcist, this is your fair chance to step off the field now and... Avoid any potential spoilers. There will be spoilers from both the first and second season of The Exorcist. If this is of no concern to you, then please feel free to join me as we take our place at the batting box to see if we can score a grand slam with this particular analysis. So we begin our uh, we begin the episode with uh, Father Devin Bennett, who we haven't seen for a couple of episodes now. He is in bed in the hospital still. But this time he is in a dream sequence with his sister Anna, his deceased sister Anna. It has been 22 years since his sister died, and he is now having a dream about her in his own state of vulnerability, where she is talking and asking him about why he never returned for her after he left their home in Punia. And this Punia, I am assuming, is part of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Bennett says that a cardinal found him as a much younger individual and he had a chance to escape the life that he had in Punia and get an education, probably somewhere in Europe, maybe I would speculate in the UK, in an environment that allowed him to develop and express his innate brilliance in a way that perhaps his native homeland and environment would never have given him the opportunity to to obtain. We don't know the circumstances of his sister's death and we don't know why he was not able to find her again when he went back to look for her, as he says, but we do know that Anna is dead. We also know from the interaction between Father Bennett and this dream sequence sister of his, that he has always felt guilty about leaving his sister behind. He probably believes that she died because he was not there to protect her, and this has always haunted Bennett, and the memory haunts him still to this day. This is continued in this particular scene of Unworthy, as we see further that as we move back into the real world, there are two German dudes in the hospital with Father Bennett, and they are talking about Bennett doing some kind of convincing of someone about something. We don't know who it is they, they are saying that he should convince, and we don't know what it is they're saying he should convince, but they believe Father Bennett will be an asset to them if he is integrated into the demonic system. And we see beneath Father Bennett's bed that there is a vocare pulveri urn, and out of that urn is emanating the demonic mist and the demonic voices that are presumably, anyway, causing this dream of Father Bennett's to take place where he is seeing his sister. This was kind of the same thing that was going on in three rooms in the first season when Bennett was dying after being bled out and he started to see the demonic mist that was above him and Father Marcus and that demonic mist started talking to him in his sister's voice and he started calling her name. The same thing appears to be happening now but in a different way in which the demon is trying to lure Bennett into integration vis-a-vis his dead sister. So it's clear what is going on is that these two German dudes here are obviously part members of the conspiracy and they are there to try to do the same thing to Bennett that was done before and that is to lure him to the dark side. Now the next scene we move on to we see a reunion is taking place between Marcus and Tomas after Marcus was forced to leave Tomas behind in the previous episode when he went into this trance-like state after communicating with the demon, or in this case perhaps being inadvertently and unwillingly and unwittingly uh, brought into telepathic communication with the demon. But we see more than that. Marcus is surprised when not only does Tomas show up, but this time Mouse herself shows up in an unexpected reunion. Now we see that Mouse tells Marcus that she left Bennett behind, which I believe quite frankly was a big mistake. A mistake that allowed the conspiracy to catch up with Bennett in a very vulnerable 
position where he was unable to defend himself, where he was unconscious and did not know what was going on, and where he had no opportunity to escape their grip. And this is why I think you see those two German men in the very first sequence, unchecked, unchallenged, and now they have the opportunity to try to integrate him if he accepts integration. Well, anyway, Mouse tells Marcus that she left Bennett behind. She also tells Marcus that she encountered Maria Walters in Chicago and that Maria Walters is dead. Now what I find interesting about this is we see that Mouse seems to have a talent for obfuscation. And what I mean by that is she seems to have a talent for twisting the truth or telling half-truths. She does not tell Marcus and Tomas that she was the one who actually pulled the trigger and killed Maria Walters and subsequently as a consequence of that got Father Bennett injured. She tells them none of this. She doesn't, just like she didn't tell Father Bennett, that she and Marcus knew one another almost 20 years ago and that they were maybe quasi star cross lovers or maybe they had an infatuation with one another, but she just tells him in one of the previous episodes that they worked together briefly. Well, that was not entirely true either. So it looks like she has a talent for telling. Uh, half truths. We go on to see that these two lovers have it out with one another in front of Tomas. Maus is obviously very resentful of Marcus leaving her behind when she was possessed in the Abbey in Iona in 1999. And when Marcus asks her why she's here, that is present at these events, she tells him she was possessed by this demon for six whole months. And during that time, we see that Marcus says he tried to fight for her with all he had, but it wasn't enough. And so he felt he needed to leave her in more capable hands than his own. Well, she says that she should have been in his hands and that he never should have left her. But nonetheless, Mouse goes on to say that what is happening is bigger than what took place some 20 years ago. We see that Marcus and Mouse and Tomas are continuing to try to exorcise Andy of the demon. One of the things that I see here that was very intriguing to me was how Marcus was surprised by Mouse's apparent poise and her growth. To see in his face the respect that he had for her in watching her so confidently quote Psalm 91 along with him and Tomas, to see her so confidently confronting the demon inside Andy without fear or without reserve or without hesitation. These things showed me that Marcus was very much surprised to see the growth arc that had taken place in Mouse over the past 18 to 19 years or so. And I think that was good to see him accept that. He, in fact, after all, had not seen this woman in almost 20 years. He had no idea what kind of growth arc she had undergone. Mouse has obviously evolved. She's obviously grown. She's obviously changed from the chicken that she was in the past to a very strong, confident woman of faith and principle. And she obviously has learned how to fight not only for herself, but to fight for a cause and to fight for others within that cause. So we, I would like to see some more exposition about Mouse as this show goes forward, if she is in fact going to be part of it. But anyway, their efforts fail. While they are trying to exercise Andy, their efforts continue to fail and, and the demon does not leave Andy's body. We see here in this instance that this is a very strong entity. It is a very feisty entity and it will not give up easily. And so, as it is showing its, its strength, the the exorcists began to recognize that they are running out of time. Why are they running out of time? Because soon, because the kids have already left the island, they are going for help, and sooner or later, the police are going to show up, and eventually, they are going to find out where these people are, that is, where Andy is, most specifically, and if they find these three exorcists with him, well, then, of course, all hell could break loose for them as well, in the legal sense, because they will not be able to explain sufficiently, anyway, their presence in these events and their role in these events. And this will leave them in a dilemma that they cannot afford to be caught up in, not only because of the legal procedures and the police, but because this could also give time for the conspiracy to catch up with them and to possibly try to either integrate them with demons themselves or kill them should they resist. So the three of them realize that they are in fact running out of time. 
to save Andy. And this leads us to some more drastic decisions being made, particularly by Mouse. Mouse decides that she wants to execute Andy and kill the demon inside of him. I say that quote unquote, kill the demon inside of him, rather than continue to try and remove the demon from Andy's body. Now I've got a few questions here. I want to know how you kill a demon with a bullet. I mean, I understand in the strictest sense of the term that you're not killing the demon necessarily, but the whole idea of going ahead and killing the host, which itself shows some very, um, uh, I think that's a very gnarly move on uh, Mouse's part to try to do something like that. But the notion, whole notion of trying to kill a demon by shooting its host, you don't kill the demon, you just kill the host and you free the demon out of the person's body. At least that would be most people's understanding of how you're dealing with an immortal being. They can't die, and certainly can't die by someone using something as mundane as a bullet to kill them. Okay, so but so there's, there is some suspension of logical es exposition for the story's sake in that regard. But it just kind of seemed weird to me that they would use such a mundane notion of such a, a process to try to get rid of this demon. Marcus tells Mouse that to stand down. He takes the gun from her and he says that we are exorcists, we're not executioners, and that is the totally the wrong move. But this does kind of give me an indication. It shows a little bit about Mouse's character and what she's become. Now, why? Why and how and for what, under what reason she has chosen to become this kind of individual, especially in the name of God, we don't know. Again, that's, that's a need from further character exposition. She, so she now wants to execute Andy as a means to not only preserve the man's soul and stop the demon, but also because those three are running out of time to save him. Now this is interesting also because as Marcus stops her, the demon inside Andy decides to chide Marcus's own morality about killing someone himself. Now Andy tells Marcus that you yourself are a killer. And this is the demon's way of trying to get at Marcus, to try to make him hesitate, make him doubt. And who he's referring to, of course, is Brother Simon, the integrated priest from season one, who was involved in the conspiracy to try to kill Pope Sebastian during that season. It was Marcus who stopped Brother Simon. And it was, in fact, Marcus who not only stopped Brother Simon, it was Marcus who killed Brother Simon, or if you want to use the term, executed him in public by slitting his throat, as Andy says in this very episode, from ear to ear. Then he talks about, the demon that is, talks about Marcus killing his father when he was only seven years old after his father had killed his mother by beating her in the head repeatedly with a hammer until her brains literally fell out of her skull. The demon tells Marcus that you didn't just defend yourself or, and didn't just defend your mom who was already dead, you actually enjoyed it. Again, another attempt to try to confuse Marcus and make him doubt and hesitate. We also see that Marcus doesn't listen to this and he tells the demon, you are the first one of your kind to ever actually get that right. But he also says that his father was a mad dog who deserved what he got and Marcus does not regret this in the slightest, despite however the demon may be trying to use it against him. Tomas decides to offer himself as bait for the demon. Now we know that Tomas has been using his uh, gift, if I guess if you want to call it that, of communicating with these entities across this season. So he decides to go back to the well one more time and try to use himself as bait for this demon to see if he can get it to leave Andy's body by offering himself. One of the things that I liked about this particular sequence or this particular part of the sequence was that you see Marcus and Tomas bonding even further. They are now becoming brothers. The fellowship between Marcus and Tomas is growing. Even with some of their personality conflicts, even with some of their different disagreements over methodology, the fellowship between these two men is growing. And you see that happen when, you see that uh, being expounded upon when Marcus tells Tomas, I don't want to lose you. And then Tomas says to him, then bring me back. But the decision is made. But I really enjoyed this sequence because as I said, you see the fellowship between these two is growing. And you see that fellowship growing in terms of their camaraderie together. 
in terms of their brotherhood together, and in terms of their respect for the mission that they are on from God to save captured souls from the grip of the evil one and his minions. We're now inside Andy's mind, and we see uh, Tomas, that is, is inside Andy's mind, and we see that the demon comes at Tomas in this uh, kind of dark, I guess, kind of oil slick looking form with these kind of like cat eyes, you know, how cat's eyes glow in the dark. Well, that's how these demons' eyes kind of look. They were glowing in the dark, and there was nothing else around them except this kind of dark shadow. Well, we, we, Marcus, uh, Tomas comes up against this, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, He's inside Andy's mind, and we see the demon explode into a bunch of liquid, and that's because Andy has attacked the demon with a baseball bat, and he has managed to defeat the demon, at least for that point. Now, what we move on to see here is that Andy is telling Tomas that he, there is not a lot of time here, and that there is not a lot of time to make a decision about what to do with this demon. Its, its power is growing, its grip over Andy is growing, they have to come to some, uh, some kind of agreement about how they're going to finally stop this thing. Andy tells Tomas he is willing to sacrifice himself in order to stop the demon. In other words, he in fact wants to die and take the demon with him. Now, Tomas disagrees with this decision, but ultimately he begins to relent as more and more evidence becomes apparent that this is really the only way to stop this entity. But in the meantime, Andy tells him that he has messages that he wants Tomas to take to all of the kids to let them know that Andy was still there and how much he really loved them, loved them all and cared about them. We move back into the real world after this to see that Marcus and Mouse are still talking together. And we see that Mouse is now chiding Marcus for how he has handled this situation. She believes that Tomas has in fact been blessed with some type of gift, perhaps from God, and she compares Tomas to an atomic bomb and, and, and criticizes Marcus for saying, you're using the gift that God sent you, this atomic bomb that is Tomas, like a surgeon's scalpel. She says that Tomas is a weapon that can be used to turn the tide of the war that is taking place between the demonic and those of the light who represent Christ Marcus is wasting this gift, he is wasting this talent by simply using it to deal with individual people. Instead, Tomas needs to be let loose. Well, Marcus answers this criticism by saying the problem with bombs is they don't just destroy themselves, but they destroy everything around them within a certain destructive or explosive radius. But Mouse doesn't seem to care. She believes Tomas's gift, if again, if you want to call it that, can be used to turn the tide against the demons, against the demonic, against the satanic that is taken over the church, this conspiracy that is in fact reaching its tendrils out into different parts of the world, into different sectors of human society. She thinks Tomas can help turn the tide. But I would fundamentally say that I would disagree with using Tomas in such a capacity because we don't know what the consequences could be, and the atomic bomb analogy is a very good analogy if you think about how, how devastating it, the, uh, an atomic or a nuclear weapon can be when it is exploded, when it is detonated. That is a good analogy, because it does in fact point out that if Tomas's gift, again, I use that in quotes, if Tomas's gift really is that powerful, it can not only destroy Tomas, but it can inadvertently destroy even those who will try to use it for good and with right and positive intentions, not just destroy the evil individuals who have given themselves over to the satanic conspiracy. Tomas goes on to offer himself to the demon as the, sh as the show goes on. And as we see what is going on between the, the sequences are shifting between Andy's inside being inside Andy's head and shifting into the real world where we see Tomas with his eyes all whited out and in that trance state once again that we've seen him in before when he's communicating with the demons and he's there beside Andy's body trying to communicate and talk to Andy and trying to help Andy to stop the demon. The demon confronts Tomas in the form of this oil slick that we saw before 
and Tomas offers himself to the demon. The demon relishes the idea of taking another priest, of taking another exorcist, of taking another man of God and integrating itself with him. So it, it attacks him and it tries to complete the process of integration. As we see this taking place and unfolding, Andy is trying to reach out into the real world and tell Marcus to kill him before the demon can finish the task. Marcus is looking back and forth between Tomas and Andy and he is now in the position of having to make a gut punching choice, a harrowing choice that will in fact tear at him and he chooses to save Tomas and he fires a gun, the same gun that, that Mouse was going to use to kill Andy. He fires the gun at Andy's head and he kills him and he prevents the demon from completing the integration and we see this occurring. The next scene then involves Rose defending Andy to the cops and she is telling them that Andy was a good man and that for six long years he raised those kids and loved them with all of that that he had but interestingly enough he does she does not tell the police that Andy was possessed and of course I can understand why she would not but she leaves that part conveniently out and tries to weave a narrative that basically tells you that Andy somehow went crazy somewhere in his state of losing his children, in his state of defending his children first from Lorraine Graham, Harper's mom, and thereafter uh, somehow or another he lost control of himself and maybe he went mad and he started attacking the kids and maybe trying to kill other people. At the same time that we're seeing this, we are seeing that Andy's body has in fact been staged. The body has been staged with the gun in his left hand and to make it look like he killed himself inside of the old witch's house instead of Marcus shooting him. And of course we see no signs or evidence left behind that anybody was in the house except Andy. So has the, the three exorcists have conveniently disappeared and probably will not be trying to testify in any regard to what took place either in the natural or supernatural sense and of course Andy's body has been left by itself to make it look like he went to this place to kill himself and be done with whatever was torturing him in the physical or natural sense so this was a very interesting uh, part portion to me to see how that played out and I thought to myself, you know, there's some very interesting ethical questions that could be raised by the three of these priests, the three of these exorcists staging Andy's body as if he committed suicide rather than the fact that he was shot in order to stop a greater and more evil force from continuing to, to take over his body and use him as a means to commit very wicked and evil acts. So as we go forward, we see once again that the, the Foster family has gathered. They are all talking to Father Tomas and here's where Andy's messages to the kids are relayed. He relays a message to Rose telling her that he had always cared for her, probably had always loved her to some degree, and that he hopes that she knew that even though he didn't tell her that explicitly. Tomas goes on to relay Andy's messages to all of the kids in particular, he relays messages to Verity, he relays messages to Shelby, and of course to Caleb and Harper in the end. Each one of these messages relays something about the kids individually that he saw in them and that he loved about them and that he would miss as they grew up without him. We move on to see that Marcus has decided to leave. He's decided to leave because he is, he's killed a man and he believes that this has compromised him in fact, and that it has made him unworthy. In fact, what you see Marcus say is, you can't do this job if you're compromised. And he says to, he tells Tomas that he learned this a long, long time ago. And he tells Tomas the three pillars of the exorcist or what should be the three pillars of, of the exorcist, maintaining purity doing no harm to the innocent and putting duty before self. Maintaining purity in, in the sense that you maintain uh, moral and, and, and ethical purity. This could be applied to matters of sexuality or any other number of areas. Doing no harm to the innocent. This is clearly applied to Andy. Andy was an innocent man who even though he unwittingly 
and unknowingly brought a demon into his life and into the life of his kids, he did not choose to deliberately and consciously serve this demon and to do its bidding. Unlike, for example, by contrast, the members of the conspiracy who have in, who, uh, who have in fact chosen to consciously and deliberately serve the demonic realm. Such examples would be people like Brother Simon and Maria Walters and Cardinal Guillaume, all of which, all of whom chose to serve the demons in order to gain power and influence for themselves in this life. So you do no harm to the innocent. And then you put duty before self. In this sense, Marcus was talking about the idea that you put selfish desires and selfish and personal concerns aside for the greater cause, the greater whole of serving God's justice and God's order in the world. Even if it means in those times when you have to sacrifice your own personal agendas in order to do so, putting duty before self. So these three pillars are what Marcus expounded upon or told Tomas that he must maintain and because he, Marcus, has killed a man, he believes that he is compromised and therefore unworthy to stand upon those pillars, at least for the time being. And in this sense, I can feel Marcus's pain because he spent a lot of time trying to reconnect with God throughout this series. And at several key moments, you see that Marcus feels that he has lost that connection to his source of power. And when he finally does reconnect with God later on in this season, you see him, at least in his own mind, lose that connection when he is forced to make a choice to kill Andy rather than let the demon continue to occupy Andy's body and win the day. Tomas tells him, you know, he can't do this alone. But Marcus reassures Tomas that you can, in fact, do this. He calls Tomas an exorcist. And in this sense, he is not calling him an, uh, a student any longer. He is referring to Tomas as an equal. And this is a very important moment, a critical moment of character development for both Marcus and Tomas. He tells Tomas that you put your trust in God and no one else. A beautiful moment to me, people, even though it was heartbreaking because Marcus was deciding to leave to go find himself again. It was a beautiful moment in the sense that you see the growth between these two characters. And again, as I said before, you see the fellowship, the brotherhood that exists between these two characters as they have grown together and begun to accept one another more and more across the life of the series. So Marcus says goodbye. And I believe that that goodbye is not forever. It's just for now, just as Tomas believes it is. But he goes outside, he goes and he talks to Mouse, and he tells her that she also, he says, you've come a long way, little church mouse, and she has, and he fully recognizes that, and he tells her to take care of Tomas, and then he walks off into the sunset, that old trope of, of seeing the, 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 the mentor teacher walk off into the sunset so that he can go find himself again, so that he can go reconnect with the source, so that he can have that wilderness experience, if you will, that Jesus had when he went off into the wilderness to seek God by himself that wilderness experience of trying to go off and find God again and reconnect with God again so that he can come back at some other point in time stronger and more confident in his purpose and in his mission and in what he has to do to help those who are trying also to accomplish these same type of goals in the world. Well, as this goes on, we see that Mouse is talking to Tomas and Tomas tells her that he cannot do this by himself. And he, he firmly tells her that he that Marcus has done this before. He's left before, but he'll come back. And here's where Mouse tells him she doesn't believe that that's the case. Mouse has, may have cause to know that Marcus may or may not come back. Perhaps even more than Tomas. Even though I think personally that he will. I agree with Tomas about that. But Mouse says maybe not. And she says maybe not because 18 years ago, Marcus left her behind. And she did not see him again for almost two decades. And it, had it not been for the providential reuniting of these individuals by the designs of God himself, perhaps, had it not been for the circumstances that surrounded them and caused them to be reunited again, Mouse probably feels in her own heart of hearts that she would have never seen Marcus Keene again in her lifetime. So she tells Tomas, do not take comfort in the fact that he's come back before. 
because this time he may not come back at all and you may never see him again. But she does give him this consolation. She tells him that if God sent Marcus to you to start your journey, then maybe he sent me to you to help you continue your journey. And so Tomas accepts this, at least for now. And so he and Mouse ride off into the sunset or into the night in this case to continue the work of saving those conquered souls or those captured souls who have been lost to the demonic. And of course, continuing to go up against the conspiratorial forces that are now threatening the church and by consequence, of course, threatening the world at large. Now we move back to, one of, uh, to Father Bennett in the hospital and we unfortunately see that Father Bennett has in fact succumbed to the demonic forces that were trying to control him in the opening sequence of the storyline. We see that his right eye, his natural right eye has been pushed to the side and a demonic pupil is now in its place, indicating that Father Bennett has in fact been possessed by the demons that were trying to capture him in the first scene. Then we see that he goes and kills a nurse, Exorcist III style, and those of you who have seen Exorcist 3 know exactly what I'm talking about. And then thereafter that a statue of the Virgin Mary has had its head cut off somewhere at some church in the world in the very following scene that comes right on top of that. I like Father Bennett. Aside from Marcus, he is my favorite or next favorite character in this storyline. And he is a very awesome guy in my opinion. If Marcus is the brawn of this story, then Bennett is the brains of this story. He is the man with the plan. And I regard both of them equally as being two awesome priests in this storyline. And so if you kill Father Bennett, you're gonna have one ticked off fan. So we move on from there to see that Rose has adopted all of the kids. And here's where we get our happy ending, another happy landing folks, and they are all joyfully reunited and they pile on top of truck in a great big hug group hug we see marcus i guess he's still in seattle at this point but he's at some pier somewhere or some dock he walks out and he begins to hear from god at first we see that there's this kind of buzzing noise that cancels out everything else around him and then he starts to say i hear you i'm listening as if he of course is talking to god and then we see more trepidation hang upon his face and we see him say Tomas with this great deal of concern. He now realizes that he has to get back on the path. He's got to get back on the stick. He can no longer take this, uh, I guess you could say this extended sabbatical that he's on. He must return to his duties. And here again, those three pillars that we're talking about, putting duty before self, Marcus understands this. And so now we see that the show ends on this cliffhanger. So that's the conclusion of unworthy and this is why Marcus felt himself to be unworthy and this is why this was the title of the story but this was a very worthy episode and a very worthy conclusion to the second season of The Exorcist and once again I have to say that this is in fact one of the finest shows on television so I'm very much looking forward to seeing what happens with season three and I hope that this show makes a speedy and swift return to television for its next exciting year. Now, having given the story this immaculate praise, there is one criticism that I will offer. We all know that there is a conspiracy going on inside of the Catholic Church and beyond the Catholic Church with the satanic darkness that is now enshrouded in and is threatening to take over different parts of the world. We see, we have seen from, from season one and now season two, that this conspiracy is vast and deep rooted. It is in all sectors of human society, from business to academia, to government, and of course, religion. We have seen that its members are international in scope, and we have seen that they are definitely well hidden and well concealed from the society at large but we have only seen scant portions of this, and we don't have a sense of the larger objectives and the larger plans yet. We have seen some of those members of the conspiracy be, be eliminated, such as Maria Walters, who 
this series took a great deal of time and effort to try to establish the character of Maria Walters as one of the principal members of the conspiracy in season one, and then we come back in season two and she's shot in the head and killed. We don't see anything else about what she has, what she was doing in the interim. We know, we just know that she was at some point vying to be one of the primary members of the conspiratorial agenda, and that she was in fact set up to be that way. But then she's just knocked off her pedestal and killed in this year. We saw the same thing with Cardinal Guillot, who was also one of the principal members of the conspiracy in season one. He too was assassinated by Mouse. We saw Brother Simon killed in season one, who was responsible, primarily responsible, for the assassination attempt on Pope Sebastian. He was killed in season one. The question becomes, where and who are the members of the conspiracy? Who are the principal players? Where are these principal players? And what is the ultimate aim and agenda of these individuals and their minions across the world? So we need to see as season three progresses, we need to get more serious about the conspiracy. Otherwise, we as members of the viewing audience will not be take this conspiracy seriously. And we will begin to doubt that it actually has amassed as much power and that is that it is in fact as dangerous as they continue to make it out to be. So I would like to see major moves by the conspiracy to show us the scope and reach and depth of its power and of its ambition and of its deviousness. Finally, I will say to those of you who watched my reviews of The Exorcist here on YouTube, I want to thank you very much for coming along with me and thinking with me about this series, and we'll see you again when The Exorcist comes back for its third awesome year. Until next time then, be blessed. Darling, I got to tell you something. And I don't say this to everybody. You